Hello everyone and welcome to the Melbourne Traditionalist Podcast 87. I'm Mark Moncrief from Upon Hope and today I'm going to be talking about freedom of speech. Now I'm going to be looking at three different aspects of it. First I'm going to be looking at the liberal idea of free speech. I'm going to be looking at the which includes the history of it. I'm going to be looking at cancel culture which is increasingly becoming a big issue. And then I'm going to be talking about the traditionalist idea of speech. So the first thing we have to understand about free speech is that it is a liberal idea. And the liberal idea basically says that freedom is the goal and absolute freedom is always the best freedom. So more freedom is always better. That's not a traditionalist view of freedom, but it is the liberal view. And free speech is very much a part of that liberal mindset. And as liberalism advanced um, from the 1700s onwards, it has pushed this idea that there's no limit to what you can say because there's no limit to what you can think. And thinking and speaking are the two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. So if you are stopped from saying what you really think, then you are also stopped from thinking what you should be able to think. And if you are not able to think, if your mind is not free, then you are not free. You're you're a slave. You're, You're controlled. You're a prisoner. And liberalism says, no, those things are wrong. Men should be free. And so so should their speech. So that's where we are now. But, of course, every society, including liberal societies, have always said that there's a limit to speech. And by speech, we need to take that in its widest context. So we're not just talking about the spoken word. We're also talking about what's written down pictures, and that includes moving pictures. So sound recordings, all of those things are speech for the purpose of this discussion, even though it's going to be a one-sided discussion. And uh, every society has said that there has to be limits to these things, that you can't actually have free reign. And again, That includes every liberal society, and that includes ours today. So there are certain things that you're not allowed to shout. Now, the famous one is was given by Justice Wendell Holmes, who said that you don't have the the freedom to shout fire in a crowded theatre when there's no fire. So that's often said that, yeah, there has to be common sense limits. But what people often forget is that that judgment came down in 1918, and uh, it was about whether people could actually say that America fighting in the First World War was wrong. And pacifists, who were the ones who were put on trial, said that the war was wrong and that Americans shouldn't participate in the war and that American people should be told that and American citizens should be able to say these things. And the, the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, you know, we're at war, there's a fire, you're not allowed to say things that are, that are going to cause trouble. You have to toe the line. And even in peacetime, we have this. So, you know, you can't slander people in most places. Uh, in the United States, it seems that if you're uh, well known in any capacity, then you can be slandered. But in most places, slander is regarded as not free speech. Um, swearing. Swearing is against the law in most places. Even if it's common, it's still against the law. Um, you know, calling people nasty names because of their, their race or ethnicity or religion that's generally regarded as against the law. Again, even if it is an everyday occurrence, in most places, it's still against the law. Other things like pornography, particularly child pornography, 
are against the law. Uh, one thing that's been an interesting development in uh, pornography and the law, like free speech, is that increasingly countries are banning bestiality and images of bestiality. Surprisingly, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, a lot more places actually made this type of thing legal. doesn't mean that they, they encouraged it or they wanted it, but it wasn't illegal. And increasingly, it is becoming illegal, which is a very interesting development, I think, because it goes against uh, the broader liberal principle that people should be able to view whatever they want. Now, maybe we should look a little bit at the history and why free speech has come into existence. Because there was a time where saying things could get you into trouble very quickly. And uh, everyone knew that you weren't free to say whatever you wanted. You know, you couldn't say that Jesus Christ didn't exist, for example, um, in a lot of places. In fact, m nearly everywhere you had to say that he did or be quiet. That's not true, of course, today. But uh, people did go to jail. People were in prison. They were fined. They were even executed for saying that Jesus Christ didn't exist. Heretics were, of course, executed. And they were prohibited from speaking. They weren't allowed to preach what they believed. And that was a big problem in the early Reformation. People came out with different ideas and other people said, no, you're not allowed to say that. So religion was really where this idea of freedom of speech first came into existence. That if someone has a different political view, then they should be allowed to say it. Or there should be some forum where they are allowed to say it. They are allowed to say it in their church or they're allowed to say it on, on this particular street corner or, or, or in this field or what have you. But they still should be allowed to say it. And that is the very beginning of the idea of free speech. Because before then, there was no concept of free speech. And it took a long time for this idea to develop. Something like two centuries for people to actually say, in the West at least, that you could have difference of opinions about religion and you could still talk about it. You could, you could talk about it openly. But that then led to the political sphere. Could you say things against the king? Could you say things against the monarchy as an institution? Could you say things against particular uh, po politicians or, well, they weren't really parties, but I'll, I'll call them parties, uh, political parties that existed? Could you actually say things against them? Well, in a lot of cases, no, you couldn't. Again, you could be arrested. You could be um, tortured. You could be fined. You could be executed. Uh, in England, the last time that someone was arrested and suffered a consequence for uh, insulting the king was in 1715. So that's, uh, that's a long time ago. But in France, not quite so long ago. And in other countries, quite recent. And in fact, in countries today, Thailand, for example, on, in Thailand, they don't have the king on their coins because you could drop it into the toilet or into the gutter, and that's disrespectful to the king. So none of that. Now, the, polit the polit political started off very broad. Yes, you should be able to say things, and it became much more specific. Like, well, maybe I'm putting it the other way around. Maybe it was more specific and became broader. Uh, but... People were in, say, 1800, they were a lot more restricted in what they were allowed to say about the government. Now, in the United States, of course, there was the United States Constitution, and 
the amendment said that you could uh, you were free to say what you wanted and this of course is a massive boost in this idea that that there is a freedom of speech but even in the United States there was a lot of things that you weren't allowed to talk about and a lot of that wasn't legal it was societal and if you did say them it wasn't against the law but you still got in trouble there were still a lot of very powerful people who could make you suffer for saying whatever you wanted to say and over the course of the 1800s that not just in the United States but around the world it became more and more obvious that you could say what you wanted even against very powerful people and very powerful institutions and that led to the idea that everything was up for grabs there was there was no topic that couldn't be discussed that wasn't open and then we get to the 1950s and in the 1950s we start to get a new discussion about what people are allowed to say and something that's uh, we don't hear this term very often nowadays but it was very much used in the 50s and and before that and that's sacred cows so in india cows are regarded as sacred in the hindu religion and that term that you know there, there were things that you weren't allowed to talk about was known as sacred cows as I said, today you hardly ever hear, hear this term, but you go back and you'll hear this term quite a lot. And one of the sacred cows of that time was sex. You weren't allowed to talk about sex. Sex was between a man and a woman and it happened in marriage. And the purpose of it was to produce children. And that was the traditional view. And then people said, well, hey, why should we, who are free to say what we want, to, be say, to believe what we want, why should we be held back? Why should we have to go along with this idea that sex is something that can only be discussed by a husband and wife? But why can't we tell jokes about it? Why can't we, we make films with, uh, with topless people in them? Why can't we have films with sex in it? And in the 50s and 60s, these things began to move from the very fringe, which is where they'd been for a long time, into the mainstream. And by the 1970s, they were the mainstream. And one of the reasons that was used as an argument in favour of legalising pornography and allowing it into the mainstream, allowing people to, to view it, was that we were a free society and there were people in the world and they were talking about communists who weren't free. There was the communist world, and in the communist world, pornography was completely banned. So in 1960, basically there's no difference between the West and the communist world when it comes to pornography. And by 1980, there's an enormous difference. In the, nothing has really changed in the communist world. In the West, a lot has changed. And, uh, and in fact, if you ask the average person in the West in 1960 whether they thought pornography should be legal, most of them would have said no. But by 1980, it was legal. It was freely available. Um, you know, go and consume it at your heart's content. But what that shows is a very again a very liberal idea that that everything's that, that that absolute freedom is the goal and you should be able to view whatever you want and in Denmark in 1969 they actually legalized all forms of pornography that includes bestiality and it includes child pornography for 8 years child pornography was legal to produce in Denmark but bizarrely having sex with children was still a crime 
but it took them eight years to actually rectify that. And mostly because uh, the rest of the world said, hey, you're making us look bad. You know, we're trying to, to, uh, to make pornography acceptable and you're, you're, uh, you're making it disreputable. You know, lift your game. So in 1977, Denmark did. But then we have the idea that everything has to be constantly pushed forward. Everything always has to be about that more freedom, more and more and more. But of course, there comes a limit where people aren't that, that keen to have more because they know that it's destructive. But liberalism doesn't accept that idea. Liberalism has a very, very hard time with accepting that idea. Another idea that it has a hard time with is consequences, and that the legalization of prostitution, of, sorry, of not prostitution, of, of, um, of pornography, um, the legalization or the, the um, liberalization of social mores would also have consequences. So men and women shouldn't have distinct sexual roles. And that includes when it comes to sex. That basically men and women can be as equally promiscuous and there won't be consequences from this. But of course, there are consequences. One of the big consequences has been rape culture or so-called rape culture. Because what we have is young women who are engaging in sexual activity finding that it's not to their liking, not the sex, but the emotions, because sex and emotion come together. And they've been told that, no, they're separate things. You can turn your emotions on and off. And of course, that's not true. It's not even a little bit true. But what happens when you're a young woman and you've had sex and you're told that that's your right, that you, you have an absolute right to engage in any form of sexual activity you like, but you actually feel bad about it. You feel dirty. You feel violated. Well, what's another word for violated? Rape. And here's a whole culture that encourages that. That's what they mean when they're talking about rape culture. And of course, like all liberals and leftists, they can identify a problem, but they can't work out that they're the cause of the problem. So instead, they say, oh, it's men. Men are the problem. We have to have to change men. And of course, that's not going to work. But allied to that is cancel culture. And cancel culture is the idea that people shouldn't be allowed to say things out loud and that also goes to political correctness that if you can stop people from saying things then you can stop people from thinking things that's the ultimate purpose of political correctness and cancel culture sure cancel culture says hey this person can't appear in public this person can't go on on tv you know, this person is not allowed to have their book published. But it's all part of the same thing. It's all about if you are free to say things, then you are free to think things. And you shouldn't think these thoughts. And if we can stop you from saying them, then we can stop you from thinking them. It's a bit of a bizarre idea when you think about it, but it is what they believe. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave traditionalists? Well, traditionalists have always said that there is a limit to what you should be able to say. You shouldn't be able to, um, to say bad things about the monarch. I mean, that's, that's quite obvious. Um, about God. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't say God doesn't exist. But that's different to saying nasty things about God or about religion because one's just an idea, an opinion and you, you can be wrong 
traditionalism accepts that you can be wrong and cancel culture and political correctness does not accept that you are not allowed to be wrong you must be right at all times which of course is impossible but at the same time we say that mostly people should be left to get on with their lives the government should not be out there looking for people to say the wrong thing and to jump on them basically we should people should be free to live their own life and if they are offended then they should do something about it not that other people should do something about it so if someone calls someone a nasty name and they become upset well they should confront the person and if the person doesn't apologize then yes then they make it an official complaint but what they don't do is say oh my friend bob was insulted i'm here to lodge a complaint for him um this person frank who uh, who insulted my friend bob he, uh, he he's not allowed to publish his thesis because he said nasty things well no no that's not how it's supposed to work people should be able to be wrong that's the basis of traditionalist speech that there should be limits to what you can say but there shouldn't be, that shouldn't be absolute and the other thing that is often forgotten is that there should be and this is a term that was used a lot in the past and that was a time and place so you know men swore amongst themselves but it was regarded as bad form to swear in front of women or children but there was always a time and place so it wasn't that men were forbidden from swearing it was that they should do it when there are other men about not when there are women and children now i'm not saying that's right or wrong or that's how it should be but what i'm saying is that the basic idea that there should be a time and a place you know so if you want to say nasty things about people there should be a time and a place for it you should be able to do that and you should be free to do that in that time and space and i know that there are a lot of places where they're now saying oh you know even if you said it in your own home you should be be prosecuted no no we absolutely do not agree with that um, and i think even if that was blasphemous or if that was uh, against the monarch you know in your own home you should be free to say what you want it's when you come out in public that you should have uh, have i guess some decorum some discretion that's really what we we want well this is a little bit earlier than i normally finish it but i think i will finish it here um, thank you very much for listening and hopefully i'll speak to you again next week thank you everyone bye bye